So we were talking about the Bayer designations of stars. So this is a way of designating stars with a Greek letter, okay, and the constellation. And so if you look on star charts, uh, it gives you that. In fact, even in with Stellarium, you click on a star, it'll give you the Bayer designation if it's bright enough to have one. But the problem is that you only have so many letters in the Greek alphabet. And so uh, right away, astronomers started realizing that for constellations, they have lots of, of, of bright stars. Then you have more stars that you can see than there were Greek letters. So they weren't really sure what to do. They thought about maybe using Latin letters to, to do this, uh, but that didn't really work all that smoothly either, because either, some Latin letters look a lot like Greek letters. And so this was just confusing. And so they decided you know, not to do it that way. The really big problem here with the Bayer system is there were too many there were too many constellations that had stars more than there were letters in the Greek alphabet. So John Flamsteed comes up with another way of designating stars, and he has an interesting idea. He says, "Well, why don't we just you know we have a constellation that has all these stars in it." And so what you can do is label them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, going from uh, right to left across the constellation. We'll explain why you did that later. Uh, but this way you could number all the stars. So as, 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 when, as long as he could see the stars, he gave it a number. And so he published a catalog naming all these stars. So an example of that is the star 51 Pegasi. So you do the same thing. You use three-letter abbreviation or you use the Latin genitive case, uh, Pegasus. So Pegasi, P-E-G-A-S-I. And so uh, that would be the, the Latin genitive case for Pegasus. And so this is what you do. Now, the advantage is you never run out of numbers. A disadvantage is that if you have a telescope, you see there's more stars that he didn't label. So there has to be another way of naming it beyond what he had. But this way worked really well for a long time because it got every naked eye star labeled. And so this, this was much, much uh, improved. Now, some of these stars already had Bayer designations, and so they had both Bayer designations and Flamsteed numbers. Well, by the uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, Frederick Argelander uh, decides that that's not good enough. And so he publishes a star catalog called the Bonner Dirtschmuckstrung, which means the star catalog of Bonn, Germany. And in this catalog, he labels the stars by the angle the telescope is pointed. We'll talk about what that angle means later, but it's the declination angle. And he points the telescope uh, at a certain angle and puts, picks a particular starting point in the sky and one, two, three, four, as the Earth rotates and stars pass by, they get numbered. So an example of a name would be BD for Bonner's Dismuxerum, plus 36 degrees, that's the angle of the telescope, and star number 2147. So BD plus 36 degrees, 2147. Uh, he spent a couple decades and did only half the sky, the northern half. So uh, European astronomers uh, late, uh, uh, later uh, set up telescopes in the southern hemisphere and they published a catalog called the, called the Cordoba de Muxerung, which is the southern half of the sky. So an example of a name would be CD minus 45 degrees, 52, 23. The minus means to the south. So the telescope's pointed south 45 degrees. Um, early part of the 20th century, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory made a multi-volume catalog labeling positions of stars. And so a star name in there will be SAO uh, 101227. That means it's the 101,227th star in that, con in that catalog. 
there's also the Harvard Revised Photometric Catalog of Stars, the Henry Draper Catalog of Stellar Photometry, and when they launched the Hubble Telescope, they had a guide star catalog of all stars they could find so that wherever the telescope was pointed, there was a known star in the field of view. So that's not the only number of catalog listings, but that is some of them. On Stellarium, if you click on a star name, it will give you the proper name. It sometimes gives you an unofficial proper name. Also, if, if different countries sometimes call the star different things, and it gives you the Bayer designation if it has one. It give, all, 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 uh, would, all the bright stars would have one. It gives you the Flamsteed number if it has one. gives you the BD or CD number, the SAO number, and uh, HR, HD, and a whole bunch of other uh, catalog des designations. For example, the star Vega, that's the proper name of the star that's high overhead. If you go out tonight and look almost straight up uh, uh, at about, you know, 9 or 10 o'clock, one of the brightest stars you see overhead is called Vega. It's the brightest star in uh, the constellation Lyra, so it is Alpha Lyrae. Okay, so that is that is the the Bayer designation. It also has a Flamsteed number. It's three Lyrae. Uh, it's got a BD number. It's BD plus 38 degrees, 32, 38. It's got an SAO number. It's got an HD number. It's got a Hipparchus catalog number. Hipparchus catalog uh, was was done for the Hipparchus satellite. We'll be talking more about that later in the semester. It had an HR number. It had a Tycho number, a uh, Tycho catalog for another satellite. Uh, it's also is sometimes called Lucinda Lyrae. That was the name the the uh, Romans gave to it. And it's also uh, astrophysical data system entry. Uh, number 11,510A. And so that one star has all those names. Now that it's got really about four times that number of names. I just ran out of slide space here to give it. So astronomers need to know all of that. Now there's no way one person remembers all of that. And so what happens is there's online databases you can go to and you type in the name of the star and it spits out all these other names and catalog numbers the star is known by. Now, why would you have all these different things? Well, because sometimes you want to refer to it one way. Sometimes you want to refer to it another way. Uh, sometimes you want to use all the same type of designation for the stars in your research paper. And so that, that's why it's got all these different designations. When you get around to uh, the first test, one of the things I'm going to ask you is, uh, given this table of data, what's the brightest star, the dimmest star, uh, which one's the closest, farthest, hottest, coolest, which one's most like the sun? Okay, uh, all that sort of stuff. And you look at it and you go, oh my gosh, how do I answer that? And the answer is you don't yet. We're the first week of the semester. There's no way you could answer that. Okay, and so all that we've learned today uh, is how to read the first column. That's the star name. Okay. We have a proper name, Fomalhaut. We have a Flamsteed number, another Flamsteed number. These are Bayer designations there. That is a uh, that is a BD number. This is an SAO number right here. Uh, we have more uh, Bayer designations, more of these proper names. This one right here I didn't talk about, but Wolf 358 means this that star is number 358 in Marius Wolf's list of little bitty dim red stars that didn't make into other catalogs. And so uh, that, that particular star, that, that's another way of designating some of these stars, is by uh, how they were found. So sometimes uh, you have a satellite, uh, orbiting satellite, orbiting the Earth, an orbiting telescope or something, and it discovers stars. And so they label the stars, you know, uh, in a catalog. And so you refer to the star, you know, in that catalog. 
So this is how we name stars. This is how we designate stars. If you look in the book, now your book doesn't really talk about this until a little bit later chapter, but I thought it's really useful to talk about it when we're talking about uh, uh, constellations because it kind of makes sense to me to talk about star names if you're talking about star constellations. When you are using the star charts or the planisphere that we have in uh, the class, something that's interesting of you to, for you to know is, since you're just learning all this stuff, star names and constellation names are all weird words you might not be familiar with. So to help you out, they've labeled all the star names having lowercase letters in the name, and all the constellation names are all capital letters. So if you look at your planisphere, the star wheel, then uh, all the words that have uh, all capital letters, those are going to be constellation names. All the ones that have lowercase letters, that star names, uh, they also have some asterisms labeled for you. And the asterisms are normally labeled in parentheses so that you know what an asterism is. And so that's, that's a tool they've given you to help you uh, figure things out uh, for new people, for students that are just learning how to use all the tools.